it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Susie from Southern California. You are listening to my favorite show, Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, we're going to be chatting with uh, Brandon. And back in 1994, uh, Brandon was about 12, 13 years old, and he was running away from home and had a had an encounter with one of these creatures. Uh, it's kind of changed his life. And I know with Brandon's work now, uh, what he does for a living. He's out in the woods a lot, and he's going to be sharing with us different things that have happened to him. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. And I got a really cool email from uh, Jonathan Brown. You guys have heard me talk about the Browns property here in Washington State. Jonathan wrote, Several months ago, one of the locals saw a Sasquatch cross the road by our house. In August of 2020, we heard a whoop followed by a tree getting pushed down. And he goes on to describe rock clacking and tree knocking that he heard going on around him. Uh, they actually had a uh, recorder set up, and here is one of the vocals that they captured. Yeah, geez, that was loud. And it, it was nice to hear from Jonathan, and I, I assumed activity was still going on but I want to thank him for sharing that piece of audio. And while I'm sharing audio, uh, Cliff Brockman, if you go to cliffbrockman.com, this is a piece of audio from the Olympic National Forest here in Washington State. And the description is uh, screams and whoops. Let's take a listen. Definitely heard that one. And uh, that again, that was from uh, cliffbrockman.com. Uh, and Cliff and Bobo have a podcast called Bigfoot and Beyond. Definitely check the guys out. Uh, they do a pretty good job. And September 8th through the 11th of this year, uh, I will be at Phenomicon. Uh, it's a conference out there in Utah. I know they got a great lineup of uh, speakers, and I'll definitely go and, and hang out. So if you're out there in Utah, September 8th through the 11th, stop by and say hi. Again, I will be at uh, Phenomicon, and I'll include a link uh, in the description of this podcast. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Brandon to the show. 
Uh, Brandon, thanks for coming on. Glad to be here. Yeah, and you had quite the encounter. I know uh, there's a few uh, incidences we'll talk about tonight. Uh, the first one, though, we're going back uh, over 28 years ago. Uh, you were a small boy out in Georgia. If you would, just kind of start from the very beginning. Uh, what were you doing? And walk us into what happened. Yeah, I guess, it. Yeah, like I said, around 94, I was probably about 13 years old. I'd kind of gotten in trouble at school, and I decided I was going to run away like most kids do sometimes at that age, and thought I was going to run away from my problems there. I had packed up all my stuff, and I'd gotten the sleeping bag, and and then uh, took my baby gun with me. I was headed out and was gonna, gonna gonna leave home, and so I'd gotten out, and it and here in Georgia in the summertime, it don't usually get dark till around eight thirty, and I'd been walking for a while. I can't remember exactly how far I'd gotten, but I'd walked under a bridge. On the other side of that bridge, I uh, was going to cross over under it so nobody could see me when I crossed over the top. And I made my way under and got to the other side. I was kind of just looking down, and I, something just, I had this weird feeling, and kind of the feeling everybody says, you know, it felt like something was watching me. And I looked up, and I could see probably. I, I guess maybe a hundred yards, 120 yards in front of me, something was peering around the corner of a big, it was a big, big old pine tree, huge pine tree. And it had both arms wrapped around it and it was leaning over looking. And I remember it just froze. I couldn't exactly tell what it was because it was kind of shady, but it kept swaying back and forth, kind of back and forth, looking around the tree. I just happened to look out of the right uh, side of my corner of my eye there, and I could tell there was a house right there. And I was thinking about running, but I couldn't move. I, I, I just literally couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't say anything. And the only thing I think of was my BB gun. I, I just grabbed my BB gun, and I pointed it at it, and I shot the BB gun at it. Uh, like I said, I was like 13, 12 years old. I didn't, I didn't, I just thought, you know, but I could tell but right before that, I guess you could say that it, it was, it was very tall. It looked, it was huge at the time for me because I was so young. It, it had to be well over seven foot tall and it was huge. It was just real hairy. I couldn't really see it, get a good look at the face, but I could see its eyes. I was just like, just locked into its eyes and they were, just staring right back at me and when i when i shot the bb gun it stuck its head behind the tree and started grunting and it just stayed behind the tree and 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 here in the south we do a lot of logging and so the next pine tree would have probably been 20 feet from it so it just stood there just just grunting kind of a weird noise and i was still thinking about going towards the house and it looked back it, it stepped out behind the tree then and was just standing there looking at me. So I just closed my eyes and stood real still and didn't move. It literally, not beside me, but pretty close, run by me. When it run by me and got to the other side behind me, the guy, there was a guy standing up at the, at his house and he was hollering at me. And that kind of snapped me out of the, just holding my, you know, I was kind of holding my breath and my eyes closed. I was probably crying. I probably didn't peed my pants or something by then but that's kind of what snapped me out of it was him hollering and i turned around and took off running and totally forgot that he had that he had took off running behind me so i'm now running in the same direction he is and i ran all the way home which took me forever to get there i ran through briars uh huge sticker bushes i had them covered me all over my legs were destroyed from briar bushes trying to run back to get to my house that night i ended up telling my dad about it when i got back home he kind of played it off but he thought that somebody was out there like messing with me so he ended up making me go back to that spot and to where that tree was, and I was scared to death. I, I just, I did not want to be there. I was ready to go. And he tried to make me go stand in the same spot. And when he, 
he done the thing like, you know, with somebody would hold a hand up and say, how, well, how tall was he? And, you know, and it was well over, you know, where his arm could reach. And the guy ended up coming out of the house and asking us what we were doing. And my dad asked him, <clears throat> did he remember seeing him? And he said, well, I remember seeing two people down here, a small child and a, and a, and a big guy, which was kind of starting to get a little late then. And he said, I could see him run off in the same direction together. And it, that was the last, you know, the first time I'd ever made contact. I, and, and the only time that I've seen face to face kind of with uh, what I guess you call Bigfoot. Yeah, especially having the neighbor kind of back up what had happened. I know he said a little bit more than that. And we can go into that in a moment. But. Uh, you know, people might scoff at, you know, you firing the BB gun, but you're 12, 13 years old at this time. Uh, not that the BB gun's going to do anything, but I almost wonder if uh, there was a sort of a reaction because it looks like a gun and you're pointing it in their in its direction. Um, I, I'm telling you, man, I'm convinced that these things know what, what guns are, or maybe they just don't like things pointed at them. You know, I mean, it's I, I do believe that they, they know what guns are. Um, tell me, so you, after this incident of the neighbor and your dad, uh, can we back up a little bit and will you describe uh, for the audience what you actually saw that day? It was very hairy. It was a brownish color, uh, but a dark, dark brown, and it was matted looking, kind of like you would see something that had been in, in, in the swamp and it had been in mud and stuff like that. I could remember seeing that. And, I, oh, yeah, I do re remember the smell. I get I, probably that's what made me look up to begin with was the smell. It was a very, very just strong stench of a smell. And I guess that's what made me look up to begin with. And I could kind of see when, because that's the first thing I saw was its head leaning over, looking, grabbing the tree, looking at me. And I really couldn't see the face that well, but I could just remember his eyes. And they were like almost solid black, but you could still see just a little bit of the, I could see the white around just the edge of it. Uh, if you know what I'm trying to say, it's, more black but there was a, a little bit of white uh, around the edges of it and like i said it was just a, a dark brown and it could have been because of the mud it could have been a different color but it, that's what it looked like it had been rolling around in mud and uh because the hair was really matted looking um to me and i that's what i remember of it yeah, I don't think that most adults would probably handle that situation very well. And uh, you handled it pretty well for being 13. And I get why you put your gun up towards it. When you put the gun up towards it, did you notice anything with regard to its body language? Or did it just kind of dart behind the tree? It When I picked the BB gun up, it it was it was starting to step out behind the uh, the tree. That's when, when I went ahead and put, pulled all the way up and put it on my shoulder, and it it went behind the tree, but was still trying to look at me at the same time. But when it saw me raise the gun up completely all the way up, that's when it started to go behind the tree and was still trying to look at me. And when I shot, that's when I don't I don't even have a clue if I even came anywhere close to it, it you know, being that distance away. It, you know, the sound could have made a little bit of noise, but that's when it just was behind the tree kind of grunting. It was just like, rah, 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 like that. And that's when I froze completely and just shut down. I, I just completely shut down. And I, I'm pretty much that time, I guess I thought it, it's over. You know, it's something that's just going to get me and it's going to grab me. And it, I, it could have lasted probably two minutes of it doing that. And I couldn't see it no more, but I closed my eyes and I just stood there real still. I, I guess just like I was trying to make myself invisible, but I was standing out in the open. And I can remember hearing it run by, but it wasn't close, like like right beside me. But that guy was, that neighbor was hollering up there at the house constantly. Uh, and I think that's why it was running too. 
And then, like I said, I turn around. Yeah, thank God for that neighbor, because, you know, a lot of times, and I've, I've said it before in the past, and it's my opinion, and, you know, who cares what my opinion is, but I think that when you're by yourself, when it's one person, you'll have one type of encounter. Uh, when there's more than one person, you'll have a, a different type of encounter. And most of the time, when there's more than one person, uh, the aggression level will go down, generally speaking. Um, and thank God that neighbor was there because it probably threw this thing off. He was, you know, it was probably thinking, oh, there's two of them. And I know even at 12, 13 years old, Brandon, you, you grew up in Georgia out in the woods. And I know kind of your background and you guys had been out there all the time hunting and fishing and hiking. And I know you've come across some of the different animals out there. And um, so it, it, in your mind, even being 13, it, you know, this wasn't a bear. I just know that from talking to you. Always been outdoors, always hunted. And that was the only time that I had had any regulation of it. In that same small town I was in there in Georgia, uh, we had a hunting lease. And on that hunting lease, uh, there was four of us. And I was still probably 13 or 14 at the time. And my dad would put me in a stand by myself, but he wouldn't be far off from where he could see my stand. And there was two other guys, older guys that were with us. And I, for some reason, I decided not to go hunting that afternoon. One of the other guys went to his stand, but from where my dad sat on, on the field edge, he could somewhat see his stand across the field. And the guy that was out there hunting said he was sitting in his stand. He could hear something rustling behind him. He's probably 10 to 12 foot up in the air in a uh, box stand and on the edge of a field. And so he turns around to look behind him and he thinks a deer or a hog's coming through the woods. And he can remember vividly something with its hands, grabbing it, opening it up and looking through, up at him through the bushes. When it did that, he automatically turned around and never touched the first step and literally jumped out of the deer stand and took off running across the field and got in his truck. Well, when he did that, my dad was like, what is going on? So he got down and got in his truck and tried to catch up with him, but he was gone by then and ended up going to his house later on. And he was choking up something terrible to where he never would go back out there again. And he says that it looked like something with hair all over it, uh, like a man was looking through at him and, and, and grunting. He never did go back out there hunting again or, or, to my knowledge, ever did go hunting ever again. I, I think it completely ended it for him. Yeah, these things have a way of making you not want to go in the forest anymore. Uh, can I ask you about your dad? You know, what do you think your dad thinks about this whole thing? Because you have this experience and you tell him what happened. The neighbor kind of confirms what he saw. And now your dad's out there with his friends on, on the property and they're hunting. And he sees something, even to the point to where uh, he he never comes back. Uh, what what do you think your dad thinks of this whole thing? He's never admitted that he believed or he didn't believe. Uh, he really kind of uh, sometimes when I'll I'll say something about it or kidding around about it or say that you know where I moved to now, I, I've uh, I've heard screams. I've even run to one and it screamed at me and my wife and a friend on a four wheeler. And I've told him about those types of things. And he just kind of, he's, he's not, he's not going to say, yeah, I believe or, or no, I don't believe he just goes, he just listens and he just doesn't say anything about it. Yeah. Some of those old school hunters, man, they, they have to see it before they'll believe it. And I get that. I, I complete, I think it's fair. I, I get where they're coming from. Um, where are you living now and where you grew up? Uh, what kind of a distance are we talking about? So after I got out of the Marine Corps, I moved about an hour north of where I lived. And I started working for a quail plantation as a conservation specialist. I'm pretty sure my next uh, next encounter after that one, when I was probably 13 and 94, was probably around 2007, 2008. Um it would have been me, 
my wife and a friend of ours were on a four wheeler and we were riding, uh, been riding on dirt roads all, all afternoon. And we came to a Creek and the dirt road kind of ends right there at the highway and the Creek's kind of right there off of the dirt road. And we were just going to pull over and just hang out and, uh, maybe just, just take a break for a second. And we pulled up right to the edge of the woods and at, at the, uh, at the Creek and, no more than two steps off of the foal I had walk, tried to walk into the woods and something let out this scream that I have never been able to hear duplicated to hear in this area or anything. And it scared. It was like, I've heard your, your listeners talk about it before. You could feel it in your chest when it, when it happened. And, and that's, I mean, it was like, get out of this place now and leave and that is exactly what we did we got on our four wheelers and we left it was i mean it was like instantaneously it just just let out that scream and holler at us and we left um and got out of there and i've had another one uh here near my house um and 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 this is funny i was kidding with my wife about it and walked outside and I have a field, a pretty open sized field here next to my house. And the same thing again, but more, it was more, but it was off a distance from the house. You could hear it very well. Um, and it done it about five times that same scream and holler out, out near the field. Um, and we've had, you know, one of the guys that works with us, he's, 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 has seen him uh, Bigfoot face to face uh, checking irrigations one night, and if you ever get a chance, look up YouTube on YouTube and call. It's called Rude Dude. Uh, we don't call it that here, but I guess it was in 2000. There was two campers, and it's in the in the Columbus, Georgia newspaper, and it's on YouTube uh, with an account from somebody that come down here and investigated it. But in 2000, there was two guys camping down at Rude Creek, uh, Rude Creek is what it's named. There, it's a primitive campsite. It's no electricity or anything. They had a tent down there, and they had been fishing, and they had the two dogs down there. And I think it's the second or third night they were there. And I think they and another camper were the only ones down there in tents, and s- something got after them, something tried to break into the tent something <clears throat> was trying to get a after them and they ended up running and leaving and, and getting back across into town and ended up calling for a, a, a game warden and sheriff deputy or they called uh 911 and they sent a game warden out and they told him to explain what happened best i can remember is they were in the camp or uh, in the tent going to sleep and uh, whatever it was had grabbed the tent and was like kind of pushing on it. And, and so one of the guys thought it was funny and it was somebody else and he pushed back and it didn't move. And so it pushed again and they were like, and they hollered at it. And when they did it, it upset it and to where it started grabbing the tent and shaking it. And they got out of the tent, got in the car and left. And that's when they called the game warden. And he explained, he's like, well, I need you to go back down and show me where it's at. And he's like, no, I'm not. And got in the car and left. Well, they ended up leaving the boat, another car, their rifles, and two dogs plus the tent down there. And they never did come back. And when the game wardens went down there, it's in the paper, but the tent was destroyed. There was stuff strode everywhere. Their other car was there. They never did find one of the dogs, and the other dog had literally had urinated and, 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 and pooped all over itself where it was, uh, where they found it at, uh, shivering up next to a tree. The other dog they never did find. They just never could locate the other dog. Yeah, that's terrible about the dog. I hate to hear that, uh, when it comes to, uh, dogs, but, um, I know where you're at in Georgia and there's a ton of reports from there. I know if you go to like the BFRO's website, um, they don't, there's not a lot if you go there, but I've talked to a lot of people in your county uh, that have had a ton of encounters there, and, and and there's a long history of it as well. 
I wanted to go back to when you and your wife were on the four wheelers and you guys were screamed at. Um, and again, I know we're on video phone. I could, I could tell you're out in the, you live out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I'm sure you guys hear all sorts of screams and, and, you know, different sounds from known animals, but what was kind of your wife's take on, on being on that four wheeler and, and hearing that scream? What did she think? She, it, it scared her bad enough. She was crying and she was ready to go home. And, and even when she's heard it here at the house. She says she she she's kind of like my dad. She don't she's not gonna say that she don't believe or, she, or that she doesn't believe. Uh, I guess it's kind of one of those things where you got to make eye contact with it, you know. And it's just one of those things she can't explain. But she's never like fully uh, in, in not believing it, but she understands that there is something out there. Yeah, I understand that mindset for sure. Um, can I ask you on your property, is the screams the only vocalizations that you're hearing out there? I've heard wood knocks and, and, and listening to your show, I've started paying more attention at night when I take the dogs out and I have heard wood knocks. I've heard wood knocks when I've been out in the woods because I work on a, a, a place down here that's 40,000 acres of, of land that we work on and I can hear wood knocks during the daytime it can be at lunchtime it can be at 10 o'clock in the morning it can be at five o'clock in the afternoon I, I do turkey hunting and stuff and i've heard whistles and it's not whistles that a normal bird would make or or uh, that type of chirp um i've even, even been on a piece of hunting property on the same acreage that we uh that we work at me and my buddy and his kids were going to go down there and work on some some deer food plots one summer. And we decided to put a tent up down there. And so we had been out just uh, doing food plots and got back that afternoon and then set up the grill. And, and the two wives come down and brought us some food and stuff. And they ended up leaving. And the rest of those guys, we just stayed down there. And... Uh, I guess it was probably, I, I looked at my watch, it was about one o'clock and we were, we were right next to the highway, uh, where we were camping at on the main highway here. And, um, I had another one of those screens, but this screen was more, it sounded like more of a territorial screen growl. It was very unnerving. Uh, because for one, we had, it was me and my buddy but we had his two kids and a neighbor's kid with us. So this thing was no more than when it started the first time it was 50 yards from us. And the next time it was like 15, but it never did come towards the tent, but we still had a fire going and it was, it was a growl. I'd never heard. I mean, it just sounded so mad. It just, it was like, it was, it wanted us to leave and it was just upset. It terrified me so bad. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to move. I didn't, I sure didn't want to get out of the tent and look, uh, to see what was out there. But the growl is something I'll always remember the way it growled. It just sounded so mad and so evil and just, it was, it was, it was rough. Yeah, I know what you mean with the growl. I mean, it's very different than any other known animal when they growl at you, and you definitely feel it. I mean, it's something to where it's so hard to explain unless you've heard it, but it's not like any other known animal. It's not. It, it's, it's, it's very sinister. It's very just evil sounding. Just it, It's something like you would hear in a movie, but 10 times worse. Um, and, and it, it, it shook me up that night and it took me a long time to get the nerve to go back into the wood by myself after that uh, with work and, and, and just for, uh, personal reasons, you know, for hunting or something like that. But I, like I said, I, I hear wood knocks and whistles and, 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 and sometimes I, I do hear off in the distance calling. By by listening to some of the sounds I've heard before, 
uh, on this show and, and, and different things. I, I have, have heard them, but I know they're here. And it's, it's way more than I think people uh, have or imagine uh, by what just a little bit I've heard and, and you know, and, and, and other things. Uh, like there's a guy that works with us. Uh, he's been here for 40 years. And uh, back in the 80s, it was big farming here. And he checked. Uh, so we have irrigations that run at night that door to the fields and stuff. And we don't have a lot of rain. And so one of the jobs is, is one of the guys has to go out and check irrigation all night. And at a certain time at night, he's supposed to shut it down so that the system don't walk out in the road or, or something like that. And so he was going to make one of his last trips out there to, to the irrigation to turn it off, turned in the field and was headed towards the pivot of the irrigation system where the electrical box is to shut it down and noticed this big round thing kind of balled up on the ground and he when the lights got on it good he said it stood up he stood up and he said it, it seemed to him like he was eight foot tall he said with hair all over kind of a face like a man and it just stood there and looked at him and turned around and he ended up getting stuck trying to get out of there because there's been so much water in the field and he was just throwing it back in reverse and drive so much they almost burnt the pistons up in into the truck and eventually got out of there while it was walking towards him. He says he could remember the mouth being open, but he couldn't hear nothing. He was the truck was so loud trying to get out of there. And it eventually caught and went down through a ditch. He caught a uh, high tensile wire from cow where they had cows back then and drug it all the way back to his house. And the system ended up flipping over that night. And he never came to work the next day, and they ended up finding him at home. And he told them the story, and he never did check irrigation again. He said, you can fire me, but I'll never go out and do that again. When we work and it starts to get dark, he's headed to the house. And it don't matter who tells him he can't, you could fire him right then. He's going to the house. Yeah, and you know that guy saw something because even to this day, he won't go out there uh, after dark. And it's strange. I do get reports of them in this irrigation, and I almost wonder if it's a way to cool off for them or why they would hang out in an area like that. But I've had several reports of them being in that sort of area. Um, can I ask you, going back to when you were 13, and I know you, you're just speculating, and this is your opinion, but I'm curious on your thoughts. Uh, what do you think the creature was doing right before you walked up on it? I think he was checking me out. I think, uh, honestly, either curiosity or getting ready to uh, pounce on me, one of the two, because it looks just like something that you would see when something was getting ready to, you know, go in for the kill. Uh, I guess you could say kind of ambushing its prey and was looking uh, to see where I was at. The smell of it caught <clears throat> my attention and that's when I noticed it. Yeah, the smell doesn't get reported all the time, but it definitely gets reported. And, you know, I think the fact that you were pointing a gun or what it thought probably was a gun and then the neighbor, you know, was yelling in that direction uh, it, you know, it was probably thinking, I'm out of here. Uh, it's crazy. It ran past you. What I, what I think is really cool about that encounter is when you go back with your dad, uh, the neighbor kind of backs up what, what happened. Yeah, he, he said, he said it was a small kid and a huge, and, he, you know, from here, that color, he said it was a huge black man. And he's like, I've never seen a man that size before. He said, what the hell are we all doing? And daddy said, my dad just said, uh, 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 and he couldn't really say nothing. And we just kind of left. Uh, he didn't really want to tell him what I thought I'd seen because it could, you know, here in the South, that's just not acceptable. Kind of, you know, sometimes that's why probably a lot of times you don't hear about it. Uh, people just don't talk about it. Yeah. I say people from the South, but I think it's more or less just human nature that, uh, people from the South are very warm, very friendly, very, uh, they'll treat you like family when you show up. Uh, but stuff like this, they're pretty hush hush about. They, they, I think they don't want to be made fun of or be made a fool of. And I think that's more or less kind of human nature. 
Um, tell me, you know, 40,000 acres that you work on for the state with, with your job, tell me about the conservation work that you do. Well, uh, I do anything from uh, quail hunts to duck hunts to uh, I do uh, thermal night hunts uh, with hog hunting. I was on a hunt one night um, doing a thermal guided hunt for hogs. So we, we have hog here terrible. Um, I mean, any year we can catch and kill over 800 hogs a year. And it's just they reproduce it just as fast as we can kill them. But uh, we try to go out with thermals and we take people out um, and kind of guide them and, 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 and do it uh, also through uh, thermal hunting. And I was out one night uh, it was during the summer. It was probably two years ago. I had come up to a, a field and I was going to just kind of spot and look to see if there was any hogs. So I just told the people to stay in the truck. I'll walk here to the edge of the field and look if we have anything, and we'll come out here and we'll try to take the hogs. So I get to the edge of the field and I start scanning and I see a lot of deer. And all of a sudden, something caught my eye, and I still am not sure exactly what it was, but it was in the edge of the field near the, the wood line across from me, and it stood up, and it was on two legs. But the odd thing about it was, and and it still baffles me today, is how close it was to the deer that was beside it. The deer that was bedded down, and this field didn't have anything in it. I've already been haired up. And so you could see really good. The, the, the deer was bedded down no more than 15 or 20 yards from it. And it literally was already there beside it and kind of just stood up and pretty much knew that somebody was up there at the edge of the field. And I kind of just, yeah, you, know you do a double take and you're like, oh, shit, what did I just see? And I had people beside me end up walking beside me and they go, what's going on? And I go, I, I just thought I saw something weird. And they were trying to figure out what it was. And I really didn't want to say, <laughs> I just think Bigfoot. And so I pick it back up and all I could see was the heat signature, but it was already in the woods. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And you were using a thermal. I mean, if you're using night vision, you can think your eyes are playing tricks on you. Uh, with the thermal, though, you know, you, it's hard to make that argument because it just stands out red when you're looking at it on the screen. That That is strange that it was that close to the deer and the deer weren't really doing anything. Um, does it concern you? I mean, it's 40,000 acres is nothing to scoff at. That's a huge piece of land uh, to be working for the state and even your own property. But does it concern you going out there and maybe running into one that, you know, isn't a friendly forest giant? It does. Uh, you know, I've always watched the BFRO and all that stuff. And, and I always kind of thought, you know, in the back of my mind that, what they're saying, and a lot of people say that the, the friendly hairy giant in the woods, Harry Henderson's type thing, was not exactly true. And I believe it after listening to your listeners and callers that have, uh, you have interviewed before, that is not the case. And that if you do put yourself in that situation, uh, it could be your last time. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, working that big piece of property and then having your own property kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Have you ever come across anything else that's strange? Have you ever seen the lights? Uh, I can't say that I've seen any lights or anything like that that's, that's uh, caught my eye. The only thing that I have seen is, uh, and I really don't know much about it, uh, but I've heard on, on your show before uh, talking about... Uh, uh, whether the way they do uh, uh, snap trees off or twist trees or different things. Cause I have been through areas cruising timber and come back the next day and it's not, nothing was the same, you know, uh, trees were like overlapped each other and we didn't have any storms or any wind or anything like that. But with the lights and stuff like that, I've never seen any of that. 
Yeah, I thought I'd ask. I was curious if you'd run into anything like that. Uh, so you've seen like the tree bends and and that sort of thing. Um, have you ever come across any structures? I know sometimes out there in the woods, um, I think a lot of them are man-made, but have you ever come across anything like that? I've not seen any structures. I've just seen things that like two trees kind of laid across each other, two, you know, two pretty good sized trees laid across each other, like an X or uh, a lot of the times you will find a, a tree that's bent over and it's, it's uh, just, just snapped at the top, but there's been no wind damage or any, or, or another tree's not been beside it to have fallen and broken it, you know, at the top being a pretty good size up in that, you know, something that I couldn't reach up and grab. If I, even if I could reach it or grab it, I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to break it like it is. But yeah. I've never seen any like kind of like teepee structures like you, you've talked about on your show before. Just kind of like an X marking a spot or something like that. Yeah, if you would, next time you're out, maybe snap a few pictures. I would love to see uh, these X formations. And you know the difference between weather damage and something that was placed there. Um, you know, after your encounter when you were 13 and how well you dealt with it, really, um, and the fact that you you still go out there even to this day, I admire that a lot. Yeah, it, 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 it really did terrify me and it shook me up. I guess the distance between now and then me, me, me seeing or hearing again, kind of what got me back in the woods, but I always always am am you know when i do go in the woods by myself i always have something with me or i try to at least have someone else with me when i go i've, I've listened to a lot of things you, you talked about and 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 having this to be able to to listen to this uh even when you called today i was listening to uh your your podcast uh, uh while i was working in the field and uh it, it's 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 it helps to be able to know that Someone else has seen it and, and, and truly under, you know, believes or has had an encounter and has gone through it, you know. Yeah, and I appreciate you listening, Brandon. And it does help to kind of hear other people talk about their encounters. I think as humans, we, uh, when we experience something out of the norm, you know, we tend to think it, we're the only ones this is happening to. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And there is kind of a weird healing when you hear other people talk about their experiences. Uh, can I ask you, what do you think Sasquatch is? And obviously, there's no wrong answer, but. If someone were to ask you, what is Sasquatch, what, what would you say? Well, I'm not real sure. Uh, I, I don't know if it's, it's, it's a mix between a, a human and an ape from a long time ago, or it's something that's been here all along, and it's just its own entity or, or species that's just been here forever. Uh, I'm not real sure at all. I know he's he's big and he's hairy and, and 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 can be terrifying. Yeah, and I think that's a fair answer for sure. Um, do you think that they're more animal like, or do you think that they're more uh, man like? To me, I think it's more man like, but it has animalistic behavior. I guess if that makes any sense, especially because of the way it, could, it it stands up and it walks. And, you know, it could use it. It could reach around the tree and look kind of like just like we do when we're like playing peekaboo or something or, or, or you know, kind of trying to see what we can see around the corner without somebody seeing us. You know, that's 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 human like to me. I don't I don't know of any other many animals that can do that besides an ape or something like that. But that's what it kind of I think. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of times, you know, people will say they're 100% animal. I don't know if I agree with that. And then other people say, well, it's 100% human, which I don't agree with that either. Um, do you think that they're natural? Yes. Like they've been here, you know, or uh, yes, I think they're natural. And I appreciate your feedback on it, Brandon. It, it's nice to kind of get your insight on on your thoughts, uh, you know, since you've seen these things, really what they are. Uh, and no one really knows what they are, but I love to hear people's opinion. 
Um, last question I want to ask you is, if you had the opportunity, would you want to see another one? Uh, maybe like most of your, or your, your people you talk to at a distance, a pretty good distance, just so I could maybe look through it with binoculars or a spotting scope and see it comfortably without it knowing me I was there just so I could get a look at it and watch it move and kind of watch it do its thing and be far enough away from it that it don't know I'm there. Yeah, at a distance. It's hard to argue with that. I always say I, I wouldn't mind a roadside crossing if I was in a tank. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing uh, what happened to you. Be be careful out there, will you? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I, I, I listen to your show and and I've I've learned a lot of things from it, and I, I take them and, and I put them in my tool belt, and I use them uh, every time I go out there, and I use caution, and I pay attention to my surroundings a lot more than I used to when I walk in the woods now. Uh, I listen for things like the whistles and the knocks um, because it, it it's crazy out here, especially in that area that I hear wood knocks is it's in in middle of the day like i do I, I figured it would be more at night and stuff but i, I try to pay attention and, and listen more than i used to yeah i think uh, there's an opinion out there that they're only nocturnal and i disagree with that I, I think probably um a slight more encounters happen during the day than at night uh i mean they definitely come out at night but you you can run into them during the day without a doubt and I really appreciate coming on, Brandon. I really enjoyed chatting with you, man. I, I really appreciate you uh, giving me the chance to uh, tell my story. Thanks again, Brandon. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, for everyone that's going to be out in Utah at the Phenomicon, uh, September 8th through the 11th, I will see you guys there. Have a good night, everyone.
Bring the shore to life Save me from